the scene in front of the Broadway Hotel here in Dunscroft, outside Doncaster and South Yorkshire, where 40 years ago, many of these men you see here were on strike, one of the biggest strikes in history of the labor movement in Great Britain. I was here 40 years ago. I was 27 years old. I stayed in the home of a miner, went out with them in the morning to picket against the scabs. Police surrounded us completely in a circle, 5, 6 a.m. I'm back for this march from the hotel here, the Broadway, over to the pit, to the Hatfield Carlery Pit, where Art Descargill at the Pit Club is going to be speaking. He was the head of the National Union of Mine Workers. George Galloway, the newly elected MP, is also expected. And we will be filming the march and the speeches. Good idea. Maggie, Maggie, Maggie! Dead, dead, dead! Get out of order! Fire the lights! Quick! March! better than we could have been dreamed for this. Thank you very, very, very much. Right, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. My name is Mick Lanigan, I'm Chair of the Association and Trust that's been able to organise this. I'll give you more of my prattle when we're back in Pit Club. We always start off when we do anything from Hatfield with Hatfield Brass Band playing the Miners in Dressford. So I would appreciate everybody, if you take a minute of time, just bow your heads and let the band play in Dressford. Matt. Welcome to today's 40th anniversary event and welcome to the Doncaster Headstock Gears which is the last remaining headstocks in the Doncaster Coalfields. We will embark on a journey of discovery, exploration and the growth of men, women and their families when during a year of extreme hardship. 
for the right to work, for the right to provide their families and the right to keep their communities from suffering the fate of de-industrialisation. Together in solidarity, we stand here collectively, paving the way for a positive change. You are all proof of the cultural values and heritage of the mining community and the communities live on. Well, don't you look bloody wonderful like this afternoon, eh? Don't you think that after 40 years you've had enough and we should have a bit of love and forgiveness? No, never. We should never forget the spite and bile that were formed at us by this Tory government back in the 80s by Thatcher. These pit communities, it brought us something together inside. From Scotland to Kent, we know that some of the actions that took place 40 years ago had that effect on our communities, had that effect on the people that live within them, but also had that effect on the industry as well. So today, more than anything else, is about reflection and remembering. It's about commemoration. Um, and I'm sure like everybody else here today, we know people that the decades of time has withered away. People that have lost their lives. People that have become sick. When strike started, I was 18. Right, I was 18. I'm touching 60 now. So some of the older miners are not here today. So it's about remembering them. It's about reflecting on them and how they touched us and touched our lives. We're all aware that we've had 14 years of austerity. It's almost like they've come back for another pop. They've not just closed the pit down and tried to destroy the community and the industry, they're trying to do exactly the same again in terms of stripping people away, the services that they need so desperately, whether it's the NHS, whether it's local authority or anything else. But we also know that our communities 40 years ago came together and they worked together so that the women the families, the people, and they all saw like helped each other and supported each other, whether it were through food banks or soup kitchens, or whether it actually saw like making donations from other trade unionists. 40 years ago, that is what got the miners through that, that 12 years. We know for a fact that the same thing is happening in our communities. People are rallying together. Our communities are working together. We also know that they're doing these things where they're, they're providing warm spaces, they're also providing maybe, it could be sort of like luncheon clubs and things like that. Because you cannot kill a community. Because even after 40 years, these communities are still here. So, you know, when we move away from here today, we need to remember that we've got a job to do. We've got a task. We've got a duty to do in terms of passing on our heritage. And we must never, ever forget what happened. We must keep that fire burning. But more than that, we should never ever forgive what happened as well and what they tried to do with our communities. Thank you very much for your time. We stand here in the presence of a monumental ghost, a great and enduring industry. One million and some miners, the biggest single strike in the world in 1912, as over one million members of the miners Federation went on strike for a national minimum wage. In 1926, the country's only general strike saw the miners in the lead. The TUC lasted nine days before they sold us out and left us to fight on alone for nine bitter, starvation-filled months. During which time, Churchill put machine guns at the pit heads and tanks on the streets armoured cars on the docks and swore the drivers back down our holes like rats. And when Arthur Cook said we would let grass grow on the pulley wheels before we'd submit to longer hours and still more wages reduction, Churchill said he'd make us eat the grass. In 1972, the largest enterprise in Europe, the NCP, went on strike for wage increase. We were 14th from the bottom in the whole country. From 1981 to 1993, we fought Thatcher and her manoeuvrings and her book boys for the industry. A vital strategic industry, a necessary industry, then and now. We did not, as some leaders of British steelworkers have said, argue that job losses are necessary but too soon. 
Wait another 10 years and blow up the blast furnaces. What nonsense. The world needs primary steel. Britain is the only capitalist country in the world to seek to have no steel making facilities. And whether now or 10 years time, this is absurd. I conclude with a suggestion that we believe in hosting a Doncaster Miners Gala every year from now on to be held on the second Saturday of August, and that it is hosted here at Hatfield Pit or the route we've just followed. Yeah. Is that second that he's got? But friends, fellow workers, it has been my absolute privilege to represent you. Thank you. Please. Mr. Scargill, my name is Joe Laurie, I'm an American journalist. I lived here in Donskrep 40 years ago with the miners and went with them on the picket line. Writing a book and I'm back here. Very pleased to meet you. Thank you. Did a tour of America? Yes. years ago? 1959. 59. <laughs> 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 Those Palestinian flags behind, which is great. Good. Yeah, absolutely. I'll be saying something about that. I hope so too. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a Syrian grandson who looks just like all the kids have been pulled out of the rubble like that. It's unbearable. Unbearable. This lad, all the Palestinians should go out of this. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
My friend, my friend's on the right and one on the left, you see. George, how are you doing? Some cast in this team right man, Arthur's going to get his photograph taken with us. If you don't mind, we're all lined up now, Arthur, when you're ready. Lined up Number one. Ladies and gentlemen, George Galloway. A working class hero is something to be. Arthur Scargill is the number one working class hero in this country's yeah, history. Yeah, and he will always be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Smile, Robbie. I'm smiling. Oh, <laughs> George, you've got to be laughing. <laughs> You've got his hand up my kill. Feel club. That's some character. You can get up front. The crowd waiting for Arthur Scargill and George Galloway to speak. The cold is the enemy within. They were the enemy within. What have they come to our country since? Good. The Lord go will go down the world today. That will stay in my generous village when he were made it twice by police. When we nearly had the lad killed. When they kicked three shades out of us. But I'll tell you what, we fought back. We fought into a standstill. And the people stick with us and they never were in the rock with the wind of the scout. We need with that mini silence is all the way through. I'd like to ask you all now for a final minute of silence today in respecting the people that we are just waiting for our street. The fact that we lost in the community. When I talk about community, we got I talk about active way community. Thank you both Dunstroff, Stanford, Thorn, Four Ends. They, they brought workforce you and they brought that diversity of peoples into our pit. So that's what I talk about our community. And our community is a proud, proud community and we're there to let you down. We've got young people here today before it, you're... Yeah. that are joining us. They have been magnificent. They've been selling badges. You're very aware. These are the people that want to pack, pick up the button from us. So if anybody needs a, a round of applause today, please give these kisses. Please give these kisses a round of applause. Here's the Joe Gibbs. He's a clean guy to keep it. He deserves it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Welcome, kids. Proud of you. Good to have you. So, without further ado, I'm no brown. We all know that what we did during that strike was something magnificent. But one of the most magnificent things were how my molasses backed us up. I didn't just make fun for us, we went out on the picket lines when they were risking us for dropping a cigar in front of them. These lasses went out, they battled the dummies, they went to struggle the picket lines, they raised money, they raised awareness, they wear the wings and do 100,000 like and like that, and they says. So a massive return on the place from the top. <laughs> Yeah, so, I'm I'm honoured yeah, to ask Rose O'Te, hope you feel it, from the staff line of support group to stay for the roads. Thank you. I thought I'd take a retaining shot, but here we are. Here we are and you will stay. Well, that's really good. Sisters, brothers, comrades, thanks for inviting me here at Atfield. 
But before I start, I just want to remember, as we do every year, Dave Jones and Joe Green, who walk for lives on the picket lines. And then we're going to fall in love, never forget, never forget. I want to also pay tribute to Doreen Jones, David's mum. We got to know her the other well over the years, and the heartbreak of losing the beloved son never left it. But she, along with Mark, David's dad, continued the fight for justice, not only for the son, but for us all. Her strong, defiant spirit lives on and these kids are the G's. Along with all the other brave and inspirational women. Cycle in. Anthony Stoke, our group is called another Stats Man and Wife Action Group. And we made up for women from all the food centres, from all the food centres in the area of North Stan. The women of Stoke, like the Hatfield women, throw into action as soon as the strike started. It was a battle for survival. <laughs> We organised soup kitchens, made up food parcels. I was 23 at the time and had two kids and another one on the way. I was in all of these women, but I wasn't surprised because that was what our communities are like. We made up a strong women. We tried to starve us back to work, but that was never going to happen. Not if these strong, tough, resilient women had anything to do with it. And I see it all here today. Let's... Let's French from Ken. Come on, Doc. Yeah. 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 And then the words of comrade Harry Hall, where is he? I can usually see because he's dead tall. We are still here and she is. Yeah. And I'm not being fully and then worried about you. As well as organising the soup kitchens, we wanted to go out and tell people why we were on strike. So we started speaking at meetings and rallies. We went off picket lines and we continue to do the same today. We watched in horror what the police did to the villages in Yorkshire, the sheer brutality meted out to men, women and children, whose only crime was to fight for our communities, for our kids, for our jobs and the future. I don't. Our group were at the sharp end a few times as well, especially down in Rocky, where they pushed us down steep embankments and called it Scar Girl's Hut. Watch it on the back of the way. You couldn't think once. I don't know. They criminalised us. They put our people in jail. Lads from Stoke got. What are you doing? Just give us a ready talk. A real range of order, please. The wet night. Lads from Stoke got sent out for burning scab buses. They stayed through everything at us, but we're still here, still fighting on. Forty years have passed, a lifetime. Our group suffered losses. Brenda Proctor, who, who in 1984 stood with Arthur, down at King's Hall in Stoke, a first great big meeting, and she stood there as strong as anything and she said what was going on. She was a founder member of our group, an active member of National Women Against Pit Closures for over 30 years and chair of National Women Against Pit Closures in 2003. Bridget Bell, a class fighting. <laughs> Hi, Bridge. A class fighter for the mining community, from Stoke to Barnsley, a socialist, a trade unionist, Hilary McClain, a sad miner's wife, and now a jewellery mason. <coughs> and you suffered your own losses in your community. Strong, resilient women who fought for the class, 
Thank you. Take inspiration from these women. I can see the legacy here in front of us with these kids that have been with us today and for all the women that are in the room that might not have been here in 1984. This is their legacy. This is what they like. Yeah, no. And I, with every picket line you stand on, the junior doctors, the health workers, the railway workers, the others and workers fighting for union recognition, and for every march and rally you go on, the one today, remembering our great strike and marching for the people of Palestine. Thank you, friend. They will give you strength and inspiration. You are their legacy. And in the words of our song, do you want me to sing? If it's not. We are women, we are strong, we are fighting for our lives, side by side, we are killing the prison bird, the victims, and we are united by the world, united by the past, and we are fighting we go, forever working on is the Thank you, Thank you, Louise. What should we take me out just a minute? Okay. I've, had, I've had luck to be so mad and out today. Thank you, Louise, for another one. Okay. You're right, Edwin. Right. I've waited 40 years for this. <laughs> because this young man at Sanders. Maybe won't remember because he was trying to chase a park down that we were wearing a paper bag on his head or something like that at time. But I think we was going to come and speak as man's welfare. And unfortunately, because there were a lot of negotiations coming on, Arthur could speak. My dream of being introducing Arthur failed, but I'm getting in today. I am proud, so so proud, to introduce Arthur Scargill, the leader of the NUM. Before I commence my speech, I want to make a statement about the situation in the Middle East. The slaughter of more than 30,000 innocent people including children and the unborn in Gaza, is nothing less than genocide. Yeah. The perpetrators should be arrested and jailed for life. Yeah. It, is, it is terrible that the fascist state of Israel has continuously bombed and shelled Gaza, the West Bank and East Jerusalem for nearly five months. These territories are the land of the Palestine, which Israel has unlawfully occupied since 1967. And unless Israel withdraws, I call upon other nations to force back this fascist state. If the United States, the United Kingdom, can unlawfully invade states like Grenada, Iraq, or Libya, they should be part and parcel of a force together with all the Arab states driving Israel physically back from the occupied territories of Southern Israel. <laughs> Today I'm here to honor minors and their families who in 1984, 1985, fought the greatest workers' fight 
since the days of the Chartists and the Paul Bull Martyrs to save jobs, pits and communities. I especially want to pay tribute to the young miners. In 1984 and 1985, who in every sense fought for the future. And of course, like Bernard, I want to pay especially tribute, tribute to the magnificent women against pit closures, who were at the forefront of our struggle. I recall being part and parcel of the planning of trying to bring together these brave women who had established support groups in every coal field, bringing them together in one national body. That was done on the 12th of May when in Barnsley, South Yorkshire, we staged the march. More important, they staged a march. I confess that I anticipated if we were lucky, 500 would appear. I arrived from a meeting with the government appointed National Coal Board to greet them. I couldn't believe my eyes. 10,000 women were covering an area in Barnsley. The route that the march was to take had been planned by the police. But of course, women didn't do what men always do. And they told the Deputy Chief Constable, we're not going that way, we're going that way. And he said, but that's the centre of town. That's the reason we're going that way. They marched, and as we came to the public hall, not only did we fill it, or they fill it, over 3,000 people packed in, an equal number outside, but on arrival, they were told by the Assistant Chief Constable, oh, you can't bring banners into this place. <laughs> they just brushed him aside and carried the banners in. <laughs> There were only two people, who were male, allowed into the meeting. Jack Taylor, the president in Yorkshire, and myself. And as we got to the podium, we were approached by the police and the fire brigade. We were told, do you realize that you're breaking the law? There are too many people. I looked around, I said, if you're asking me to tell them <laughs> to go out, <laughs> you've got another thing coming. <laughs> but if you want to try it, try it, <laughs> you'll lose. <laughs> that particular piece of police officer had a grain of intelligence. He said, I note the points you've made and I will give you time to vacate the hall. He said, it's 12 o'clock and I want to see this hall completely empty by six. <laughs> Been 
said by the representative of the women against pit closures. A lot of them unfortunately no longer with us. They were magnificent. For the first time we had women in attendance who never left a little village. But here they were exercising for the first time their right to be equal to men and more important to support men who were on strike. The minor strike of 1984-1985 brought our union unprecedented support from workers in countries all over the world. We reminded all of the people, including the Tory government, that we had a right to strike in accordance with the United Nations Labour Organisation Conventions 87 and 98. We had support, irrespective of all their attempts to stop us, of receiving from people in France, Spain, Italy, Hungary, East Germany, Ireland, South Africa, yes, the Soviet Union, and all the Eastern Bloc countries. And on Christmas, when people in the media say it was the bleakest time in the world for families, I can recall it was one of the most proudest moments and the happiest moments I've been in. Yes. When I saw about 40 juggernauts rolling into Britain, all the honing for a change by the dockers, they brought food medical supplies and a Christmas, Christmas present for every child of a striking miner. And the women were magnificent. One of the most interesting things, we had the leading bands in Britain, the leading soloists being led for their concerts to come and perform before them. We had some of the best and they didn't want to go. It was a great day and I'll never forget it. The French CGT were magnificent. They primarily did things that were against the law. Boatloads of coal loaded in France, coming from different parts of the East, suddenly got sunk in the same. <laughs> in other words, they exercised the picket right to stop them. Yeah. Like hundreds of thousands, of trade union and labour movements, they provided support for us throughout that dispute. They often been said in the smears that have been made against certainly one leader of the NUM, where, what we got, where we got it. Despite the fact that everywhere we went, we were exonerated. But we raised over £10 billion in money that was distributed to every area in the British coal field. Like hundreds and thousands in the trade union movement, they provided for us throughout the dispute. Fourteen years ago, the Tory government, led by Margaret Thatcher, 
We had an unofficial strike, no ballot, no conference decision in support of surface workers having the right to an eight hour day. We won it.
the wrong time of the year to have a strike in March. We started it in November. <laughs> and at that conference, unanimously, unanimously we voted to have a national overtime ban. It was a success. Within a period of four months, we had reduced the stocks of coal in practically every area, including power stations, ports, steelworks, and other organizations. But it wasn't enough because the coal board under government instructions intended to try and destroy the union. On March the 1st, the National Coal Board directors in four areas announced the immediate closure of five pits, Court and Wood and Bulkleaf Wood in Yorkshire, Harrington in Durham, Snowdown in Kent, and Paul Mays in Scotland. <coughs> On Tuesday the 6th of March, the yank that they brought in to run the coal board, I'm talking about that, a void swearing, <laughs> confirmed a further 20 would be closed. That decision was unanimous. At the National Executive Committee meeting, two days later, Scotland and Yorkshire sought endorsement in accordance with the rule for permission to take action. They were given authority. <coughs> Within a week, we had 180,000 miners on strike. All of them taking decisions within the area by a show of hands in meetings. I'm fed up of reading and listening to critics who say we picked the wrong time of the year. What better time to start an industrial dispute in an industry that provided heat and warmth than November of a year. I say that simply to put the record straight. <laughs> we, have, we have a course from March to start picketing on a wider scale. We have a special national delegate conference. And I want to pay tribute to the way that that was wrong and the decision that was taken on the 19th of April 1984 for any historian that's here delegates rejected a call for a national strike ballot it was debated and put to the vote and the vote in the conference was to support the 180,000 or 80% of Britain's miners who were already on strike in accordance with National Rule 41. <coughs> but we also had to pick targets. I haven't said this before, but I'll say it now. I was convinced that the steel industry should be the area's main targeting target. Far more important than power stations, and far more important than other targets such as going to Nottingham. <coughs> important though they were. I didn't just pluck that idea out of the air. I had information from a minister, a minister in the Tory government. What 
what the position was. The television <coughs> and radio broadcasts were telling people that they had up to nine months supply. It wasn't that, but it didn't matter. Because I knew that at the steel plant, they'd only got three weeks. And I know that had we had mass picketing from the start, at picketing targets in Raymond Sprague in Scotland, Port Talbot in Wales, and Scunthorpe in Yorkshire, that strike could have been over within two months. <coughs> who, who supports that? Ironically, and I don't ask you to buy it, for God's sake, Thatcher's autobiography. She admits that only three weeks supply. And at all costs, she says, we had to do everything we had in our armory to defeat the NUM. She devoted in her autobiography a whole chapter to me. <laughs> I think she fancied me. <laughs> NUM, that they'd been taking coke from depots like Orgreef, that they began to realise there was only one way to stop it, and stop it we did, and I'll tell you why in a minute. The decision of the Mining Union on the 19th of April advised areas that picketing must be confined on an area basis. Because we knew it was both legal and morally right. It was obvious that if we could ma master enough pickets, in this case in Aubrey, we could have a chance. What's not all already known is that at Aubrey it didn't start on the 18th of June it started on the 23rd of May I know because I was there I've always believed that a leader of a trade union shouldn't sit, just sit in an office he should be at the front and going to the point of production or the point of conflict a principle I've kept all my life. Weeks. <laughs> Weeks passed. And we arrived at a situation where on the 27th of May we had a mass picket. Not as large as the 18th of June would be, but nevertheless one that terrified the authorities. My contact in the ministry <laughs> told me that the consideration had been given to deploying large numbers of police from all police forces and if necessary in employ the army. I'm fed up of reading and listening to historians and media experts saying we walked into a trap yeah. or that they welcomed us with open arms. 
Well, if that's the case, someone has got to explain to me why they arrested me on the 30th of May. Not exactly a welcome, but by the time we reached the 18th of June, we had thousands of people at Aubrey from all over Britain. It was a <coughs> magnificent display. By the way, we were not kettled and certainly couldn't have been in an area with about 10 acres of land. But we had a military police force armed to the teeth with staves, truncheons, dogs, shields, long shields, short shields. And boy, did they intend to use them. The, feet, the things that you've seen on television are only part of the story. The BBC, for example, who filmed that night, turned the film round yeah. to purport that the miners had charged into police lines. It's a lie. The miners will be battered, and I mean battered, in a way that one could not believe, and hasn't happened certainly since the 1980s. Of course, police numbers grew. By the 30th of May, they knew that we were meaning business. But the planning for the 30th of May <coughs> paled into insignificance alongside the mass picking on the 18th of June. The planning was broadcast to the world. And I personally acquired from a small old shop down in back from part of Sheffield, some walkie talkies. I've got about eight. And I was shown how to operate them because electronically I'm a failure. <laughs> it's had two switches one and two. Dave Douglas was given one in a meeting and told where to, to stand. One was given to the Yorkshire Miners Vice President and others to other pickets. And we could com communicate across this mass picket. We knew it was a matter of time before they clicked and got their technology working. But it took them two hours to find out how we were working. <laughs> and they managed to jam it. So we all, in accordance with pre-plan, switched to, switched to. That lasted for about 15 minutes, and then they blocked that. But during that time, pickets were doing an amazing job. We were, we were standing firm. And in particular, Dave Douglas and the miners from Hatfield yes. occupied, they, they occupied the plant. And they only wish they'd have stayed in. But it was an indication that we were not being battered all the time into submission, we were fighting back. And I'll tell you this, if people are charging into members of my union and hitting them with truncheons and shields, I will advise them to fight back and not simply take the punishment. Unconscious on 18th of June, and the chief constable, assistant chief constable, told the world, "I had slipped down a bank. <laughs> I injured myself. 
I need a, at least one biography. The author said, I was treated by the say, local brigade to help people in trouble. Paul Foote, no longer with us, came to interview me and he said in that distinctive voice, you see, what we really need is some photographic evidence. We need a photograph of Arthur being hit. And this lad who was with me, we had six witnesses, but no camera. The cameras had been kept back by the police. Chris <coughs> Lutz said, from South Kirby. He said, I, I took a picture. <coughs> Paul said, yeah, yes, but I'm talking about a picture of Arthur Skarger getting hit. He said, I took a picture. He said, can, can you go and get it developed? He said, I, I've developed it. I said, can you go on and get it? He said, I've got it. <laughs> he said, well, well, why didn't you publish it? He said, I didn't think it was good enough. <laughs> oh, I said, I can't believe it. I've got the original, by the way. And the people around me, including the guy who hit me with the bloody shield, he said, as clear as crystal. And I finished up in hospital together with hundreds of others, 95 who were really badly hurt. 95, by the way, who were charged with riot. I read that if issued means life imprisonment. Michael Mansfield representing the NUM, went to court and he was in possession of all the data that I was able to provide. And he cross-examined this assistant chief constable. And he said to him, how did you know that Mr. Scargill slid down a bank? He said, I was told so. So Mansfield said, that's hearsay evidence. He said, my officers don't lie. <laughs> <laughs> and Mansfield says, we shall see. Yeah. The next one on was the police officer who had said, in another case, uh, he'd been hit, he had hit this man at 8 a.m. And Mansfield said, <coughs> could you be mistaken? Could it be uh, 5 to 8? No, 8. Mike Mansfield said, but could it be 5 past? No, 8. He said, could I have a look at your notebook? The judge says, you've got to give it. So Mansfield opened the notebook of the police officer. He said, I'm going to read it. 7.15, over here. 7.40, admission that there is police violence on the day. And then this. 8 a.m., Police station canteen, having breakfast. <laughs> he said, could you please explain to me and the judge how you could be arresting this man and at the same time I'm having a nice breakfast 15 miles away in the police headquarters. And the judge said, I'm stopping this at this point. He said, you might be facing perjury, but in any event, the case is dismissed. Yay. And eventually, of course, all of them are dismissed. Just like, just 
like Hillsborough. Yeah. Yeah. It took them 50 years to get the truth. Uh, I know exactly how they worked. A very close friend of mine is Ricky Tomlinson. And I've spoken all over Britain. The facts are often repeated in media accounts of the Battle of Aubrey. But what is not reported, apart from two accounts, one from me, one from Dave Douglas in his book, Ghost Dancers. He said the police were forced to close the plant. And that they did on the 18th of June. I can confirm it because Nicholas Jones, the BBC Labour correspondent, handed me a copy of the telex from Haslam, the chairman of British Steel, closing the plant for that day. It was almost a replica of what had happened all those years before at Solde Gate. But instead of repeating that by bringing more pickets, as I urged from my hospital bed, the areas for some reason didn't do it. I say reluctantly because I've got every faith in the miners that were there. <coughs> they were courageous. A lot of them very badly hurt. You know, people on oxygen machines in the hospital where I was. As it happened, <coughs> I've no doubt in my mind that if all grief had stayed closed on the 19th and onwards, the strike would have been over. For 40 years I've been accused of refusing to negotiate. Well, that's a lie as well. We met on five occasions and reached what we understood to be a deal that we could put to our members. What happened was Contact was made by McGregor to David Hart and to Thatcher, and the deal was stopped. It's a fact. And the 2014 disclosure of Downing Street minutes demonstrates it was a, a lie. <coughs> Who also stayed closed? had it been for a, the effect of something else, far more important. We agreed to go to ACAS in order to try and negotiate a settlement in October 1984. The most important part of our agreement was to be to protect jobs of miners families, and of course, keep the pits open. We decided to approach the NACODs, that's the Deputy's Trade Union, who just had a ballot with a majority of 83%, and were in the same building in an upstairs room. And Magaki said, well, why don't we present a proposal and ask them agree to agree. So we did. And I can tell you, I wrote it in my own, my own handwriting. And uh, that result, had it been accepted, would have won the strike. So you have a right to know what it was. I approached NACODS and they agreed, word for word, these words that I wrote. Quotes, 
that the NCB withdraw its pit closure plan, give an undertaking that the five collieries earmarked for her immediate closure will be kept open and guarantee that no pit would be closed unless by joint agreement it was deemed to be exhausted or unsafe." Unquote. This proposal was accepted by NACOS and accepted, ironically, by the conciliation service ACAS. It was then submitted to the adjoining room where the National Coal Board were. Before I have a chance to even read it, McGregor says, I'm off. I'm not participating. And they, they just left the building. And so there was going to be a strike at every pit in Britain on the following week. And I knew and they knew that that would be enough to win the strike. And again, I refer you, please don't buy the book, but get hold of Thatcher's autobiography and Peter Walker, the Energy Secretary's autobiography. They both admit that they couldn't have carried on. And in fact, the minister who had become a friend of mine for industrial purposes, confirmed to me that they discussed in cabinet that they couldn't carry on, they would have to settle. But something strange happened. Two days before the meeting in ACAS to settle the agreement, NACOS told us that they changed their mind. It was ironic because for the first time in my history, the TUC urged them to carry on and go on strike. I've never known it before. <laughs> we were saying to them, we've got a proposal that ACAS can live with, that the government can live with. So why pull out? And to this day, I've never had an answer. But their decision to be betray that agreement led to the Tories deciding to carry on. And they, they said, we will have to carry on if it takes a year. But in 1985, it's significant that even then they were beginning to run out of coal, even for power stations, despite the fact that they were receiving coal from places like Poland, who should have been be no better. But no explanation has ever been given as to why NACOs performed this sellout which had terrible consequences, which led to the destruction of the whole of Britain's deep mine coaling industry. So all of those in Nottingham and South Derbyshire and Leicestershire, with the exception of those courageous miners who ignored the decision to keep working, yes. were on strike. Yeah. right to know that victory was in our hand and taken away by a decision of the deputies union. And as they carried on, they also knew that the chairman of the CGB, that was the power generating board, had confided, and again, take it from me, I know, that they couldn't carry on for another three months because the stocks were running low even at the power stations. Over the, over the years I've repeatedly said 
we didn't come close to winning. But we did win. We'd won in October with the deputies and they stood by the agreement. We would have won had the areas inexplicably decided not to increase the number of pickets after the 18th of June. And it led to a bizarre, bizarre situation. And you've got a right to know, not just commemorate, which is really important. But on the 21st of February, 1985, we held a special delegate conference. And on the basis of much of what I've just told you, I explained to that conference. And they decided unanimously to carry on with the strike. Within five days, exactly by 28th of February, five areas had written in asking for a recall conference to agree to an immediate return to work without a settlement. Now, it takes some thinking through. Why would they vote on the 21st of February to carry on with the strike, and five days later, change their minds? Not just in one area, but in five different areas including, of course, primarily South Wales. I've never understood it. I've never understood the thinking or the forces behind it, whether they were working for the union in those areas or whether they were being supported by MPs in form in those areas. That conference led to a special conference on the 3rd of March, 1985. The NEC position was for a continuation of the strike. The resolution to call off the strike was put to the executive committee. And we explained that the conference decision that had taken place on the 21st of February bound us to support our members who have fought for bravery, in bravery for a year. They decided to recommend, make no recommendation. We went into the hall of the TUC and from the floor these areas were voted to consider calling off the strike and going back to work, five areas, it was put to the vote that the NEC should be compelled to take a decision. We had, in the middle of the conference, to have an adjournment, and we met again. And the vote was for a return to work, 12, for continuation of the strike, 12. The vote to go back to work was 12. The vote against was 12. And I've often been asked, including by my grandson, where he was writing for his thesis at university, why didn't you cast a vote? I said, because I understood what was taking place. The idea was simple. If I had cast a vote in favour of going back to work, the miners would never have forgiven me. And I would, could never have held my head up again. Yeah. Mm. Secondly, if I didn't cast a vote, it means that they had to move it. And I told them that the areas who wanted it had to move it. And the stain of doing that would be theirs and not mine. The three, the three, the three national again for the history books, 
the three national officials supported the decision to remain on strike till we won. Magaki, Heathfield and Scargill. We refused to call off the strike. And the vote was 98 votes to 91. Seven votes in it. And that meant we had no alternative but to obey our own rule. <coughs> Today, my job is a simple one. It is to say to you how privileged I was to be a part of that historic event. <coughs> For a year and four months, the miners of Britain fought a battle that was alongside the greatest battles in history. It was alongside the battles of the Chartists, the Diggers, yes, and the Tall Puddle Rancers. And history will judge who was right and who was wrong. Above all, it will also result in doing what you have already heard about the magnificent women against big closures who stood up, and I'll tell you this, if it had been left to the women to have vote, we'd still be on strike. <laughs> I've had a lot of experience in industrial disputes. I've known a lot of men and women in different areas. <coughs> I've always tried to lead from the front because that's why I was elected. That's why I was at Wapping fighting for the print workers. That's why I was at Brunwick getting arrested because of the Asian workers being penalised. It's why all over Britain we take action. I believe individual action and collective action go back side by side. You can't tell people what they should do if you're not prepared to do it yourself. It's a privilege to be here today, 40 years on, from the most historic dispute in a century. It's a privilege to talk to you and to thank you for what you did. Not only the men and women involved, but to their children, a lot of them who are here today as adults. I tell you what you did and what you've done. You marched into history and you've entered the pantheon of working class heroes and heroines.